great to be here with Sun Show around us. As he mentioned, he has the show which just opened two weeks ago. And we have this book together, which just came out um, last week. Well, it's really an April public, uh, publishing date uh, with Chax Press in Tucson, Arizona. It's the third book that Simon and I have done together. The first, uh, which is also on the table along with uh, today, the new book. The first was called Salamander, a bestiary. It was uh, a bestiary, old tradition of uh, texts. Texts and images of real and imaginary animals. And we did that, uh, animals of the Pacific Northwest and of New York City and an imaginary Pacific Northwest and an imaginary New York City. Uh, and then the second book uh, was called Not a Snake. It's all about a snake. Um, and I'm more of a snake guy. That was my experience and encounter and affinity. So this was uh, Simon's turn to select an animal for which he had an affinity, and that was horses, or the horse, to which I had less of an affinity. But once Simon explained, or well, once we became aware of the fact that the cave in Lascaux, the, with the 30,000-year-old cave paintings, um, where Simon says he learned how to draw. Simon Carr was one of the last people to spend extensive time in that cave before it was closed because of the mold that was growing over the walls uh, and the eventual uh, um, the total obscuration of the images themselves. Before any of that happened, or maybe Simon was the one who caused it. In any event, Simon spent extensive time in the caves in Lascaux where he says he learned how to, how to draw. So then the book became something about thinking about what was it about the horse, or what is it about horses that, that is especially fascinating. Those people were surrounded by saber-toothed tigers and by aurochs and by uh, rhinoceros, rhinoceri that time in Europe, but it was the horse uh, that they were fascinated with and drew over and over and over again on those walls. Um, so that's where the book began to happen between us, because I knew Simon was a painter who had learned how to draw in Lascaux, uh, and continually the drawn horses in his work. So what I think I'll do is read from the book, um, and then ask you at some point to take a look at the book uh, uh, on the table to the side, to my right, your left, so you can see the drawings. The arrangement of the book is uh, a short text followed by a cascade of cars drawings, a uh, cascade of images. And so I'll just be reading the text and suggesting where the cascades of images might be. We don't have a slide projector or anything like that, and it is meant to be a book. Quick question. Can you hear me in the back? If I, my voice is carrying, because the air conditioner is on. Uh, um, should I turn off? No, I think it's a good idea to have it on, just so long as you can hear me in the back, OK? Uh, if you want to hold up the book to the page, so can see it. OK, sure. Do that. Uh, I submit it idea, but sure. Right, that's okay with you. Can you yeah. hold up the book? Okay. So, Horse on Paper um, from Chax Press, uh, which is based, as I mentioned, in Arizona. There's a dedication to the boy who fell into a cave looking for his dog. This would be the boy who fell into the cave in Lascaux and discovered the cave paintings there uh, underneath. Hello, hi to Hatchery. Nice that you're here. It's so, so nice to see you. It's fantastic. Um, and uh, so we're thanking that kid for caring enough about his dog to fall into a cave and find his enemies. So here's what, the way the book begins. I have seven pairs of eyes. Four pairs of my eyes are perpetually closed. Three pairs are always open. With four pairs of my eyes, I sleep. With the other three pairs, I'm awake. With one pair of eyes, I sometimes see a horse flickering, a horse falling. In fact, with this pair of eyes, I see only horses, herds of horses, horses moving in one direction, as if a script in a language I cannot read, and also a horse flickering, a horse falling. I do not know if this pair of eyes is a pair that is open and awake or a pair that is closed 
and sleeping. Because I have four pairs of eyes that are sleeping and three pairs of eyes that are awake, the probability is that I am seeing these forces in my sleep. But I can't say so for certain. With this pair of eyes, I sometimes see draft horses, sometimes Arabian horses, sometimes horses I am not sure how to name and that come possibly from a time before horses were ever broken. Quote, the horse is the most frequently depicted of all animals from the very beginning of art 30,000 years ago up to the end of the glaciation. The horse is far and away the most frequently depicted animal in all parts of the cave at Lascaux, right down to the bottom of the shaft. Mario Rosculli, The Cave of Lascaux, the final photographs. The artist says he learned how to draw in the caves of Lascaux. He was one of the last artists to be regularly permitted into Lascaux before it was closed to all human visitation. An absence of human visitation that had been the case for the many thousands of years between the Cro-Magnon artists who painted there and the rituals that took place in the cave by flickering candlelight to their original audiences and the cave's rediscovery in the 20th century. A state of affairs, an absence of human visitation that was reinstated the day the French authorities resealed it in 1963 and ever more strictly afterwards. As we know, they resealed it too late. Mold, no doubt introduced by the return of oxygen and of people, grew out of control and despoiled the images. Hence, in effect, Raspoli's final photographs. But of course, photographs are a 19th century medium, alien to the images themselves. Whereas the one who draws is working in a related medium, perhaps a closely related medium, to those artists who rendered such horses so many thousands of years ago. Perhaps he may draw closer. And here is a cascade of horse images. There is a horse that is a horse and the ghost of a horse. There is a horse that could only be the nightmare, which makes me think I must be asleep. There is a horse patiently waiting for the flood to abate up to its neck in water. There is an ax, the handle of which is a horse's leg. There is a hoof on the end of the handle that allows the ax to stand by itself. It is an ax one might find forgotten in a cave, leaning against the stone. There is a horse running free on the shoulder of the road. There are herds and herds of horses congregating in the water. A cascade of images. I would say when Simon and I are working together, the idea is not for the images to become illustrative of the text and not for the text to become explanatory of the images. They have to have an independent kind of being, but also speak to one another, interact with one another, including contradicting one another. So in terms of the, the text is not a guide to reading the images, the images are not um, a guide to, to reading, the, reading the, the words. Um, at least that's where we can see them working together. Why is the horse the most frequently depicted of all animals at Lascaux when there were so many bison, so many rhinos, so many aurochs and deer, so many bears and large cats, all of which to marvel at, to be overwhelmed by, to hunt, or to worship? No one knows why horses are singled out. The one who draws is working in a related medium to those artists who rendered such horses so many thousands of years ago. He says he learned how to draw in Lascaux. Horses. This is a particular Lascaux-like horse construction. The falling horse. The horse was falling. Falling 
and falling, as into a deep abyss. It fell through light and dark. It remained calm. There was no ground, or it seemed there was no ground, and thus no fear of broken bones. Just the falling, falling and falling, as if in some other time in which to fall involved no acceleration, as if in some other time in which one could fall forever. As if the artist knew that the strangest thing is a horse falling for a moment or all eternity so there could be no speeding up. As if to forever fall was never to fall at all, just to be. As if a fallen horse was the most dramatic image available anywhere. And yet, at the same time, nothing has happened. gap in the fence of perception through which a horse breaks into the visible and is alive. A woman sits on the horse's back. Her face remains invisible. The face is often invisible in the artist's paintings. Only the head is visible, not the face's features. The soul is glimpsed in the absent face a void into which one falls. Lasco, horses rendered in calcite caves engulfed now in black mold and newly hidden. Here's an epigraph from Robert Bresson, the French filmmaker. The sight of movement gives pleasure Horse, athlete, bird. Uh, Robert Bresson notes on the cinematograph. Uh, yes, we do have a chair here. There's one chair here, there. there's one chair there. And actually, I'm going to remove my bag from this chair. Okay, hold it for me. Thank you, sir. There's also a bench here if anyone would like to sit, like hidden on the side. There's a bench. You can move up here if you want. There's a bench over on the side. So there's one, two, three chairs in there, so we're good. Excellent. Yeah, no, that's good. I love that. That's cool. Thank you. The sight of movement gives pleasure. Horse, athlete, bird, and raison. Notes on the cinema's craft. Valkyries are girls on horses who perform rites of reincarnation or rebirth for fallen warriors. They do this by taking the soldiers' corpses onto their steeds and riding them from one realm of being, the battlefield, the earth, to another, the peaks, a place among the gods. Therefore, a horse has to do with transport, with the next incarnation, with rebirth. A horse ridden by a young, fertile, virgin goddess allows transport to the next incarnation or rebirth. A horse and an athletic girl in motion together carry out a ritual of rebirth. Horses have to do with migration, with rebirth, because horses go everywhere and link things in their going. Because people and horses are always migrating, always going elsewhere. Here I think of Pierre Echuris of nomadics Poetry of nom poetics of nomadics, because people and horses are always migrating, always going elsewhere. People are impatient and already almost their next incarnation. As such, we need to get where we are going at the speed of the galloping horse. And we have them. We have the horses. The horses have been sufficiently broken. The horse was falling and falling. listening to the hooves. Straining to keep up with horse and rider, self-awareness, and the self it wants to be aware of, neither horse nor rider. Inner horizon only sometimes intuitively present to the speculative subject. 
from earliest infancy, listening for the hooves. at the speed of a galloping horse, but no faster than that. After an eight-hour flight by plane, it takes days for the soul to catch up to the body. I actually know somebody who will stay in the airport 10 hours after she lands to wait for the rest of her to catch up. <laughs> And I'm going to end with this this uh, uh, this piece, and then Simon and I are ask Simon about to talk about the book. So this is page 50. Movement. Terrestrial horses trot and graze. Mythic horses fly into the heights, land at Valhalla or in Jerusalem at the site of the crucial mosque. The other horse, in free fall, descends deeper and deeper into the cavern of the earth. A horse grazing, as in a landscape. A horse on which one's familiar rides. A horse in a paddock. A horse is not a horse. A horse is a movement. Even a horse standing still. And then there are herds of horses. Herds and herds of horses. And then they were herds of horses. Herds and herds of horses. This last image. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. It was so much fun. Thank you. So Simon, um, I'm going to ask you if you would. Do you want to sit down? Uh, he wants me to sit down. I'm going to go, sit down. No, no, we bring him. Sit down. No, no, no. no, 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 no. You're going to sit on my lap? Because you needed to see him. Uh, yeah. So, so please, Simon, I, I, I would like you to stand. Someone's got to stand. So, Stand. Everyone wants me to sit. Like, oh, I sit. I sit. Sit on a horse. Got a horse. I sit on a horse. Um, so I don't know, Simon. Can you say a little bit about Lascaux? I mean, I, 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 I mean, I, I, in the book, it's so key that you spend time there. And I was put in the position of I've never been to the cave in Lascaux, and I'm not a horse guy per se, as I emphasize. So I was put into the position. Of trying to imagine, which was delightful as a poet to be put into the position of trying to imagine my way back into that space, that 30,000 year art installation, 30,000 year old art installation. And one of my initial thoughts was, um, well, it's a cave, it's very dark, obviously there must have been introduced light, um, that light must have been a candle, that candle must have flickered when we when air moved through the cave, and that would have created a sense of movement in the image, the flip. So my initial thought that is that this is a kind of proto-cinema that was being enacted in some ritual in, in the cave there. And you rejected that idea. I reject no cinema, I no cinema, it's not proto-cinema. So can you tell us a little bit about your own sense of the cave? So I visited Lesbo three or four times, and I just saw someone come in who was there with me. Um, we were able to visit because of the program. I was looking for a program, a program that Parsons had down there. Uh, I was teaching landscape painting, but there was an acre pop. Can you hear Simon in the back? Can, Can you hear me? Can you hear him in the back? Yes, okay. Um, anyway, all that stuff doesn't matter. Um, we got in by chance, and as someone pointed out, by like so many things in France, because who you had dinner with. Um, <laughs> and uh, so we got in a couple of times. I was able to draw. Um, we were there with Jacques Marcel, who was one of the kids who actually fell into the hole that found the cave in, in the 40s. 
um, and he was the last of them. He wasn't the boy with the dog. Um, that was Ravi Dutt, but um, I visited a lot of the caves in that area, uh, Fontagome, Peshmeral, Lufignac, and people remember more names. Um, but the idea that I learned how to draw there, I, I would say that in a moment of reverie, um, because the fascinating thing to me about the caves, since I knew nothing about them as any kind of anthropology, and to tell you the truth, if you meet an honest scientist, an honest anthropologist or an honest archaeologist, they'll admit they don't have any idea either. Um, no one knows why they're on the wall, really. No one knows what they mean, really. Everybody's got theories. So I was saying before, you can go into any cafe in the southwest of France and find someone in a corner who's berating everyone else on what the caves mean. <laughs> um, so no one, they're, they're very mysterious that way. Um, but, but the thing to me was that I understood them completely visually that they spoke the language that we all speak visually. Um, the language of form, the language of old line. Um, I just, obviously, it was in French, I just spent a long, uh, a couple of weeks in the Louvre, and it was completely at home. Um, and, but the difference to me was that they, it, it was presented in a way that seemed to, to me, at that moment, uh, very accessible. So that when I was drawing from them, it was, it was partly like being, working from a master painting in the sense that you're working from a, you know, a work of genius, so you're getting like a whispering in your ear from someone who knows what they're doing. But also it was like coming home. It was like, a, it was like that's what line can do. I knew that, right? That's what form can do. I knew that, uh, but I didn't know I knew it. Um, so in that sense, yeah, I guess it was. We used to, we, it was an interesting program. It didn't last about a couple of years. But um, we take groups of students through some of the games, not through Let's Go, but take students through the games and they would draw. And that was always really fun because no one, None of the people down there, the people whose lives depend on the caves, who aren't scientists, but who depend on the tourism and the visiting and all that, had never seen anybody do that, so it's really fun. But um, the image of the horse is what you said. The image of the horse is, it predominates. And there's no way of explaining it really, except they ate them. Um, but they don't, you know, the, the amount of bones that are found, the proportions of horse to reindeer and all that kind of thing doesn't explain it. It wasn't all horses. So they're really from the very beginning, there's something about horses and something about their relationship with horses. And those particular wild horses were nothing like these old horses that I spent time with and that I paint. Um, they were wild horses. They were ferocious. I mean, you, you wouldn't mess with them. Um, so why they were chosen, why they were there, um, especially at my school, there's so many horses and there's such a procession of horses through that name. All of the bulls, some of you may know, um, and then at the very end, one goes off the edge, and there's a falling horse. So I, 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 you see, I can do this for hours. Yeah, well, that's no, fantastic. But I don't want, no. don't want to do it. Yes. We can open it up in a little bit for uh, questions, conversation, so on. But I do want to ask you about the juxtaposition between the book and the show that you have on the wall now. I have in the book uh, the line, the face is often invisible in the artist's painting. The face is often invisible. Simon Carr's paintings, only the head is visible, not the face's features. The soul is glimpsed in the absent face, which I think is true of the drawing that faces that text, but is also true of the paintings we're surrounded by. So could I ask you to talk a little bit about this show? Yeah, uh, I've, I've, I've been painting horses for a, a long time, all because of, I don't know if she's here. Um, my wife and my daughter ride, and my family is upstate, and there's a lot of horses there, and so I spent a lot of time with them, so I can't ride for all kinds of reasons, and, um, but I can clean up, <laughs> so that's what I do. Um, I shovel, I shovel, and I feed, and I get to know them pretty well. Um, so I've been painting them for a long time, since they first started appearing um, you know, to my family. Um, and I've learned a lot painting them. I've learned a lot trying to keep up with them. I and mean, like anything, you get involved in something like that. Um, and the first thing you do, if you're a painter, the first thing you do is draw, draw, draw. Second thing you do is say, holy smoke, how does this thing work? And you start, so you start studying anatomy, trying to understand how the machine works, which is really, in the case of horses, don't get it done. Um, they're the strangest, strangest creatures in a lot of ways. 
-hmm. Like, did you know that that hoof is one is their middle finger? Mm -hmm. Right, pointing down the hoof is a fingernail, and it goes just goes on from there. Um, so they're they're very so if that whole subject is really interesting. I make that I make students at school draw them, and then a couple of weeks ago I started lecturing them on the internal digestive system of the horse. <laughs> and my wife said, "Do they really need to know that?" <laughs> but you know, the cecum it's really interesting. But anyway. Um, but one of the things that came up in the horse paintings that, that, that helped me progress in the horse paintings was back and forth between the horse and the ground. Uh, where, the, where these horses are, where the horses are I paint, I paint most, are on a hill. So they're standing on a hill, so there's always the pressure um, of the ground. There's always the pressure of literally the ground. The ground in the painting, um, <coughs> the color of the field against the color of the horse and how they're moving and how that creates the space of the painting and how that paintings of the horse and the field and the sky and all that starts to interact and create something that's more than just the animal. Um, so I, can't, I had a big show of those last summer of horses in, uh, in May. And so when I came back in the fall, I started working and I realized how much even just working with these, it's the same, the same, the, what I learned from the horse paintings is so obvious to me um, in terms of movement and in terms of gesture in terms of how you can, it's really a fascinating kind of idea of how you can, you can render something, of how you can make something real without detail, without, without stupid detail. That's the only way I can put it, I'm sorry, I'm sorry if you're that kind of painter. Um, how, can you, how can you directly, how can you directly communicate that experience of movement or presence or face or emotion, those emotions that are created by the interaction of all these little people um, without being stupid. And that's just my problems. That's my vocabulary. Um, but, but it came from the horses because the horses don't have, they're not stupid. Um, they don't have that kind of, at least for me, they don't have that kind of obsessive face thing. They don't have that kind of obsessive, is it right? Does it look right? Blah, 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 blah. Um, and I was able to carry that into the, into the children. Um, these paintings just started in the fall. Um, but I painted kids always, and I painted that park. This is a park over on Bleecker Street. I painted that park a lot. And so it's, it's, it came together, a lot of different things came together. Um, if you look over here when you're one of us, there's a lot of drawing, there's some drawings anyway of, of the kids more directly. So I don't draw, uh, mostly, but mostly they just made up. I draw, I draw my kids. I had a lot of kids, and now I have a lot of grandkids, so um, I can press them into being models, at least briefly. But, um, so I mean, there's really, I, I, that's why I brought some of the horse paintings. These are some of the ones that didn't make it into the show last summer. But just to get an idea that they're, what the horse paintings do, these do. And that's, that's what's so interesting. That all comes from, can I say that? Yeah, that all from, comes from the case. That all comes from the case, yeah. Um, so, so we've known one of the few years, this is the first book we did together when I first met Simon, his paintings were someplace between abstraction and figuration, very fiery, very red. We have a common love for Andre Messon, I think Andre Messon was an early influence. Then you moved in many different directions. You were painting inside of churches at a certain point, doing modernized or contemporary versions of the crucifixion and a Bible scenes, uh, a Bible scene, right? And then uh, I saw those morph into subway scenes, uh, like scenes from hell perhaps, or scene, box. Bible scenes were becoming subway scenes in, in the New York City subway. And from there, I may be missing a phase or two, in, but into the, these kind of things along Along very local, right around here in the neighborhood, uh, along the river, along the, the, the park, along the river, of kids and dogs, not horses, but kids and dogs in Cleveland. And I don't, could you say a little? So we've emphasized let's go, but I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of some of those other influences, whether it's Mistan or Episcopalianism <laughs> or or you know just some of those, because I think there are other things playing. Oh, um, it's painting what. I mean, I guess in a way, it's painting what interests me. I mean, you could say that in the most crass way, what interests me at the moment. Right? What, I'm told, what I'm fascinated by at the moment, the only way I can think about it is, is my painting. The only way I could sort out you know, 
biblical narrative was to paint biblical narrative. Mm -hmm. um, the paintings down by the river, I mean, these are all things, and the horses are all things that are right in front of me. And I don't think of it as, I, I'm not working from observation much. I did for many years paint landscapes from observation. Um, but the, none of these, and none of nothing for the last many years has been from observation. Um, but it's the things that are in front of me. It's the things I'm experiencing directly. Um, it's the emotions I'm experiencing directly. Um, and hopefully, we had this conversation in the gallery with some people the other day. Um, hopefully, maybe the language of form, um, but I hope the conversation's about emotion. I hope that what we're talking about is that is the intimacy of experienced and the intimacy of what I'm feeling about the world, what I'm feeling in the world. It's not what I feel about the world, it's what I'm feeling in the world. Expressing the feeling in the world that they, you know, they can be then accessible. And that's a hard impulse to define and a hard impulse to excuse and a hard impulse to understand. But it comes, it, it, the, pro, the provocation comes from outside um, and then the digestion and then it comes, it's just like a horse. The digestion. Um, so these the paintings are actually the odour. Um, but they, the, the point is that this is a thing seen. And it's always a thing seen, a thing experienced um, very deeply. And like these started with just this kid who was staying with us. He was one of the ones you see in some place. Um, and I started drawing him and then, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. And then the studio on the walls I start filling up with drawings and, oh, these are interesting. And then all of a sudden, Six months later, we've got a room full of, of uh, playground games. So it's it's really hard to explain what what brings me to each of the motifs. But I do paint motifs, and, and I think a lot of painters do. I think it's a real a real problem with art school and a real problem with the art world um, in that you get branded with you, know, you make X and you're selling you're selling X, right. and so that may be me cutting my own throat because I don't sell eggs. Mm -hmm. they, they change. Yeah. But I've met painters, um, really famous painters, who sell lots of X yeah. all over the world, and they were trying to paint something else. And the galleries would, wouldn't show them. And they were furious with him because he was doing, he was painting his kid. And um, he wasn't painting like stripes. And um, should have had a kid with stripes. Then. But I guess I've never, I've not, I've never had the problem with kids selling that much, so. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah, no, it's very helpful. Comments, questions, anyone could, no, but please, let me call. Yeah, Everybody. I just wanted to make hey. a comment about what you said, that's very interesting, that you said that you don't think from direct observation, but that's what they were doing in the case, because they were, the horses were not in the case. Oh, of course, case. yeah, yeah, that's a good one, they yeah. They didn't have any, so this is. It's what they carried into the case. Yeah, but see, that's supposed to be the big moment, the big human moment was what they took what they took from what they saw and then brought it into the cave. And that's supposed to be the, the difference between that's supposed to be like a turning point in consciousness. Where you could take something from what you've seen and, and bring it into the cave and rebring because because they're incredibly detailed. I mean they're very and they're anatomically very precise when they want to be and very and very exaggerated when they want to be. Um, yeah, but that's exactly the moment. It's the moment of it's the thing you experience, the thing that that grabs you there, that then you, and then, yeah, that's really nice, because I'm doing the same thing, I'm crawling back into the studio where it's nice and dark, um, and, and painting these from memory. Somebody had an equation of that, they said observation, what is it? Observation, memory, imagination, something like that. That's like the process of, um, you observe it, you remember it, but then somehow in the remembering of it, something's created. Um, please. Oh, I love uh, oh, good. How are the horses different uh, anatomy-wise? They must have been if they weren't domesticated for so many Different. Like different. their form. How are they different now? Yeah. No, right. how, are, how are the, the horses in the cave? How is their form oh, different? Oh, yeah, they call them Przewalski's horse. I'm not, I'm, don't quote me. Um, <laughs> the horses then were, they were smaller. Um, their manes stood up like a crew cut. Um, and there's still some horses, they tried to breed them back. Doesn't do well, but there's still some horses in Mongolia, those ponies, um, that look just like the horses in the case. Um, they're shorter, they're squatter, um, they're fatter, um, 
and they're they're ferocious. I mean, they don't, you know, most of them. You walk into a field with, Christina can tell you, um, if you walk into a field of horses, the kinds of horses that people ride today, I mean, they're usually pretty, but these guys, these guys are very, they're much more aggressive. But, but basically the same, anatomically they're the same. Equus is equus. Um, there were many, many variations. It's one of, oh, don't get me going on this one. <laughs> <laughs> keep going, keep going. You know, there, there were, you know, they used to think evolution, if you want to call it that, evolution was a straight line, but now they're talking about it being more like broccoli. Like it just goes like that. And we pull, we pull a thread through it with what we know. So we know that horse. So we pull the thread back. But there are many, many, many kinds of horses and many, many variations on just, it's great when you look at the books because they end up, the, all the horses we know end up with one toe on the ground. But they start out with five, just like we have. And then so there's all these variations, three toes, two toes. Um, so, but, but the one we ended up with um, is pretty much the horse. That you see in the caves, and you, you can tell because it's, they're so precise. They do these beautiful things with the hooves. Um, but again, you, when, the nice thing about the caves, just to come back to that for a second, is the language they're speaking is the language we speak visually. So I, you know, you can show a drawing one class or a life drawing class, which some of you have suffered to be back there, um, and you can show them the. the the horses from last bone. So see this is how you do it. See this. Is how you, here's how you make one thing look like it's in front of another. Here's how you put one leg in front of another, and it's the same. You know, and that's really exciting when you think how old it is. Um, and Chauvet, someone who's mentioned Chauvet before, uh, Chauvet's even older, ridiculously old. Um, it's the same. The same language. What? What is that? What? What is old? I, mean, in, in I don't think. Um, when I was in, you might be, they'd say Lascaux was 17,000, then it got up to 20,000, and others, people like Leonard was saying, some books are saying 30, mm -hmm. and Chauvet's definitely 30 or more. 37. So it's, 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 it's inconceivably old. Um, it's inconceivably old, and there's, but that's the exciting thing, is that it's still human. Yeah. We know it's human. Um, and I think I think you're right. And that was the human moment. The human moment was being able to go, see something, hold on to it, right? And then, for whatever reason, nobody really knows. Um, they love to talk about hunting magic, but that's all such junk. Yeah. The old guys all said that. All the the old guys used to say that. Oh, it's hunting magic. They put them in the game and then stab them, and then the next day they'd be lucky in the hunt. That's totally. <laughs> so why are you putting owls down there? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it's. Um, it's much more complex than that, right? It's obviously, a, you're walking into a cathedral, right? But you don't have a Bible, yeah. right? You, you're walking into a cathedral, but you don't have a text to tell you who all these people are. Yeah. Yeah. Please, I don't know. Yeah. Um, on the caves, and as an artist, can you recognize if it's a Oh, that's interesting. Um, each cave, each, oh, sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> yes. There's different styles, but almost always, like in Let's Go, um, there's a master style, and then you can see that there are other hands involved, but they're all following the master. Which, again, that's totally our language. Master of master, oh no. Was, we don't know if it's men or women or children. Or but um, there's, each cave has its own style that way. And you can tell it's a collective, but that there's well, a, you, a, they, they a, say a apprentice and a... Yeah, then you can say that it's a, a apprentice. Yeah. Um, and they have now found, this is all old news since I've been out of it for a long time, but, um, they have found shards of stone with what are apparently practice, you know, apparently stone. Um, but that's one of the things about the caves is there are no mistakes, right? There's no, uh, you know, there's nothing bad. There's nothing that goes off the mark. They all seem to be driven by an impulse. Um, and, and a lot of it, you can't, you know, when you, a lot of it's engraving in the wall, or paint. You're painting onto calcite, or you're painting. There's a chemical reaction between. Okay, you guys are really going to get it. <laughs> um, the reason the caves survive at all is it's a true fresco, right? There's a chemical reaction between the paint and the vehicle that, that they're using, which is probably urine, and the limestone in the wall, so that the, they become one thing. So you can't you can't erase, 
right? I mean, it's all, um, it's all very direct and, very, and you see the hand because of there it goes. You know, I mean, you can see the line being made. Um, and they're really great lines. I mean, if I was in a moment of egotism, which is after all what the whole show is about. <laughs> if you look at the drawings, um, the way that line moves, like it goes in and out, and in and out, and in and out like that, that's something from there. Mm -hmm. In a little pathetic way, but no. Please more comment in the back. Yeah, please. Um, no, I just wanted to, um, I guess just to add on. It's not a question, but I guess just to add. Please. But um, it's interesting to think that most of these cave paintings, um, we actually look back at these paintings to get a sense of what these prehistoric animals look like. Oh yeah. And so it's interesting to see how um, we're kind of also relying on them because of the kind of accuracy. Because uh, a lot of like, uh, for example, like the, the rhino, like Plasmatherium, which is like this giant uh, right. rhinoceros, um, or rhinoceros like creature. Um, we actually, from the paintings that we've seen, we, we can kind of uh, deduce that like the way it looks and like how much hair it has, and also like saber-toothed cats, like uh, if they have stripes or not. Sometimes I think they look kind of ridiculous in stripes, but um, they could have also been like the variations and things and coat cats and stuff. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, just the, uh, I think that it's not us just um, relying on what they think, but also we're looking back in time and uh, kind of asking permission to like see these things. That, no, no, that's absolutely right, Carlos. And, um, and even down to the uh, the patterning on the well, on the horses, uh, back to horses, but the patterning on the horses that you can tell what time of year it is, right? So you can tell, and then you can tell the which ones are pregnant. And a lot of the horses in the last were pregnant, um, and you can tell from the patterns on them. You know, whether the hairs, so some, on some of them you can see the hair hanging down at the bottom, so you know they have winter coats and things like that. You know the rhino at Lesko? No. Uh, so I'll show you later. <laughs> it's the only X rated, well, the only slightly X rated thing. Right. Please. Oh. During the period of the paintings, which went for many, many years, I don't know how many, thousands. Yeah, thousands. Weird. That's very weird. Very weird. Um, nope. Each cave, as far as I know, and maybe there may be people who know more. I'm sure there's people who know more. Um, no. So you look over 10,000 period, you know, 10,000 years. It's closer to Egyptian art, anyway, but Egyptian art is like that much compared to that much of Paleolithic art. But um, no, there's not pretty much the way we would like to think of it. And again, that's a, that's a model we have in the in the pathetically tiny amount of time we think of as Western art history. Um, and we see, you know, Renaissance, the dozen, the dozen, here's the progress, or here's the change, or here's the whatever. And that's all that you should excuse the expression of brainwashing by modern art, that idea that you know, this happens, and this happens, and this happens, all like this Marxist inevitability, right? Da, 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 da. But that's not what the caves are. There's no, uh, caves are different, and rendering's different, and animals are rendered differently in different caves. But you don't see that. Please. This is just so fascinating. And um, it's um, rare to be able to hear somebody talk from their own experience of being in the caves. And um, I'm curious about um, over all the years um, since you were there, um, is there any one horse that comes back to you that's Oh, yeah. Um, um, yeah, not in Lasco. And um, there's a little cave called Komar that's um, underneath the castle that actually has a duke, which, <laughs> it, it's only funny because if you're an American and you meet a duke, you have two reactions, you go wow, or you go, screw <laughs> off. Um, but anyway, there's a castle, and he doesn't live in it anymore, but um, underneath it is a cave that was used in the Middle Ages for animals, as a, as a barn, basically. But, but then in the cave, there's a passageway that's, it's not four or five feet wide. And there's a full-size horse um, against the wall in relief, but absolutely incredibly detailed, running, 
really fast, uh, nostrils flaring, the mane blowing, and you just, it's, and you can't get more than like this from it. Wow. Though, though, you know, that's always the big mystery in these things, so what was anybody thinking? But, um, and that, that was a lucky thing to see, it was only because we knew the Duke. But, um, and it's, you know, it, 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 we're not, we, this should, we're not doing it justice to them, but um, it's part of the cave wall, right? The cave wall bumps out and that becomes the back end of the horse, right? Or there's a break over here and that becomes an eye. Um, so there's always that kind of integration with the medium, which has nothing to do, I mean, maybe it does in a way because of the constant back and forth. I mean, the things that I was trying hard with these was to get the figure in ground to work back against each other that way, to create a space for the figures to be in so that there's pressure from the, there's pressure from the uh, ground color, the, you know, the color of the asphalt or whatever, there's pressure from that against the figures to push like that. So it pushes out, but not quite, and the figure pushes out. And yeah, that could, that could be a react, that could relate to what the walls of the caves were doing. I mean, in some caves you see it really dramatically, like a, a certain formation of the stone. They're limestone caverns, so it's like Walt Disney. You know, you're hallucinating anyway, but. Um, there's a lump in here, and that becomes part of the end of the horse, or something like that. Um, and then other times they, they completely ignore it, or they work against it. So it's, it's a, but that, the, the horse of Comorbus, that was a great horse. Um, Please. Uh, is, um, no, I don't have any theories at all. Um, whether or not, the thing of the, the idea that they're eating all these things is ridiculous. Um, there's too much, too much variety, and from what archaeology has been able to, oh, that's what I meant to say about what you were saying. What, from what archaeology can tell us, um, they were eating reindeer anyway. And there's not very many reindeer, although there's some beautiful ones in Unesco. But um, I don't know why the predators, there aren't that many predators. There are lions. Um, and there are other, you know, big cats, but much, much more limited than animals like horses. I think part of it might be the, the animals that they were, the animals they represent were migratory animals, as pointed out by the poet, um, were migratory animals, and they were basically following, the idea is that these people were following the herds, a lot like in uh, the way in Lapland they still follow the reindeer. So they were following the herds, or they were in places where the herds, please, rescue me, Keith. Um, Big hulking animal 
actually had a head that was turned back on itself, and it, it was a moose of some kind. Right? Yeah. It was a, totally out of, totally wrong for the runs of uh, uh, what he expected to see. And, and so the fact is, these people just put stuff down because they wanted to put it down, they had some reason to put it down. There was a nice spot, and it was a nice bump that would make a nice shoulder, so <laughs> they just sort of put it, put it, put it down there. It's, um, it's a, we're talking about a great length of time, first, you know, yeah. uh, you know, 40,000 years BC to about 17,000, 14,000. Um, a lot of people can have a lot of different ideas. <laughs> I, I don't know what the Cro-Magnon word for shaman would have been. We use the Siberian word shaman to cover lots of different phenomena, right, that happen in many different places and cultures over time. But shamanism has to do with the possibility a horse is not a horse. A horse transforms into a bear, or in the way you were describing it, felt like it looked like one thing, and then you look at it from another angle. You look like one animal from one angle. You look like an animal from one angle, you look at it from another angle, and it's a completely other animal. So the possibility that a horse is a horse and also a horse is not a horse. Uh, we had in our beast area, a dog is not a dog. If you look at it first from a certain, certain point of view, it's, a dog is not a dog any longer. Um, so um, uh, I don't know, Simon, I was, the question I'm gonna sort of piggyback on what you just said, the question I had for you, Simon, is you emphasize the way in which these modern horses are not the horses in Lasco but you also say it's the same, right? That's the beautiful contradiction, I think, that the horses are radically different at 30,000 30, years back, and it's not the same, it's what this horse here is not nearly as aggressive as that horse that back there, but then at the same time, there's, um, they are the same. Uh, oh, sure. so, so when you're painting a horse in a paddock at Cherry Plain, or a horse, uh, that a policeman is standing on, is, is sitting on as he rides in, uh, down the street in this neighborhood or in Central Park. Are you seeing those horses in Lasco moving with the domestic horse? Oh, sure. Horse? Yeah. But they are the same horse. Um, they are the same horse. There's two things. I'm going to come back to that for a second. But also, the other thing, uh, Kevin, I wanted to say was there's no predators and there's no humans. Mm -hmm. Very, very few yeah. humans. Yeah. Um, there are humans, but, but nothing like. And they are predators, so they, yeah. they would be predators, exactly. <laughs> and they're rendered, they're rendered with, in a completely bizarre way, that, that doesn't at all fit with what we, what we see in the animals. But anyway, yeah. um, yes, I do, think of, I do think of those animals, because that's one thing they can do in the caves, one thing the artists in the caves, whether they were men or women or whoever they were, they could create motion. And what they create motion in the animals, so you have the sense of motion before, and the sense of motion after, all encapsulated within the image that's on the wall at that moment. Um, and that's a really, an amazing feat, because what you're really doing is, within the context of something that's not moving, you're creating time. So you're, you're, you're creating something that moves from one place to another, something that's breathing, something that's, that's temporal, um, but you keep coming back to it. And that's the thing, excuse me for saying it, that's why the cinema thing does not work, because um, painting, image making, two dimensional image making, but let's just say painting, um, has conquered time. Right? It's conquered time. It, it, time. Time's a weakness. Right? You can look at an image, you can go and draw, like a lot of people I know in this room are drawing a lot. Um, you can create a drawing, um, and the drawing is real. Right? What you saw is gone, right? It may not have been real anyway. Um, but what you created is real, right? It's outside time, it's, it's conquered time. It's made, it's, it's, it's made something real that, ha that both encapsulates time, something that's about to happen, something is happening, something will happen, um, but it's more than time. And that's what those caves, that's what those caves do. And that's what the, that was like the very first step, right? There was the idea that they, they saw those things happen because, you know, they didn't have a horse posing for them up there. Um, it was all happening. It was all movement. But from movement and from change and from all of that, they brought an image. Like they, they, they created an image. They, they deduced an image. Um, and that's the thing that painting can do. Excuse me for saying it. Um, if you happen to be some other form of artist. 
Um, that's the painting can, the thing that painting can do that none of us can do. Uh, movies stink, photography stinks, you know, all that stuff. Paintings, paintings can make real um, things that are ephemeral. What rigid photography tries to make sense of movement with horses at the very beginning, or towards the very beginning? Wait, sorry, uh, say it again? Not Moybridge, but photographs. Oh, Moybridge, yeah, yeah. The Moybridge. Well, that's different. But, but he was into. Um, it was a particular aspect he was looking at. Yeah. Yeah. But those would be, I mean, I would have to say, excellent photographs. They were the ones that proved that horses actually <coughs> moved around. And that was a big. And it, it had a huge influence uh, on painters at the time. So like the guy, the guy was thrilled to learn that horse. To learn that to yeah. They do fly for a moment. For they do fly. They do fly. Please turn off. Yeah, a um, couple of things. I'm just uh, because early on you said you were and you change so time because you always had things that fascinate you and all. Do you think these members behave in the same thing as a because of course it's migratory animals, but they're not. Yeah. Well, and whether, yeah, I would go there, but I wouldn't, I'd just be careful about concrete, I wouldn't use that. But, um, yes, no, absolutely. So that it, it, takes, it takes experience and, and oh, do you really want to go there? I was about to say, um, you deduce from it, you extract from it, you, I almost said abstract from it, um, something that's real, something you can hold on to like that. I think that's right. Um, and yeah, that's what's happening because, look at these guys, shh. Um, and that's what that is. What's happening, you know? That is what's happening. Is that you're 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 any any time you draw, that's happening, right? Even if you've got a model, like so many of these guys have, um, you're saying they're drawing the model. Um, so the model, you can possibly by giving them a lot of money, get them to stand still for half an hour, um, but then they're gone, right? The experience is gone. The, the people are gone. But you're left with something. And that's, I think that's what you're talking about. That's essentially the same experience. The, one, the, the caves, I think, would be on a much more grand. Uh, and I think she's also saying, she's talking about very large animals that ought to be visible, and suddenly they're not. They're just yeah. visible for a split second, and then they're gone. There's, the, there's, they're gone. there's two bison in Lascaux where you, uh, you come off the main, and come into another, there's a couple of different chambers, and they're, they're doing that, that herd animals do when they're, uh, when you, when you startle them, they don't all run in the same direction. They run in different directions to confuse the predator. And that's what they're doing. So you walk in and you come around and they go poof like that. Um, so yes, I think they were very aware of time and I think they were very aware of, of the ephemeral quality of the animals that they were looking at. Um, and that's really interesting because that could be an understanding of what one of the things that drove them down. Because it's ridiculous, the caves. It, to get into most, and, and some of you know Chauvet, um, you, the, Chauvet is ridiculous. You've got to go underwater and over water. And, and even Lascaux, when it, was first, uh, when it was first being used, you had to go through all these passageways down into the earth. You have these little fat lanterns. Um, people get lost. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's not like you're not painting on the side of your house. Um, the, whatever they were doing, they were doing something very, very deep in the earth. Um, and there's even, you know, there's even more dramatic examples of that where people are really going through a lot of trouble to get down there um, and make these pictures. I'm gonna, yeah, uh, please. Um, I spent some time looking at some paintings, and very specifically, uh, the one human element that's very represented, even though Ferguson uses the hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there are any number of reasons given. I read all the literature on that, and, you know, and, you know, the, the missing finger series, which are insane uh, in terms of the theories. But I suddenly thought, listening to you, 
But do you have any sense that the hand is that human, that part of the human that does the drawing? Mm -hmm. And if in some strange way uh, the fact of those hands in the caves, so there's hundreds of hands, you know, in, in uh, Galgas, where Galgas. we've often gone, there are 214 hands. You know. And all of a sudden, the idea came to me as you were talking. Well, maybe the hands are there because they were kind of that human element that was used, that did all the other drawings, right? Yeah. So that does for sure. Drawings. So I don't know. It's just no, no. There's lots of there's lots of things about the gargas sleep. Also, the the mutilated hands aren't necessarily mutilated, right? Right? Because you're doing that or something like you know. Right. So, well, so I whether or not the language, the, right? The, the, yeah. 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 Okay, that's the other thing about all the hands the low, right? Yeah. Uh, the giraffe monkey does. <laughs> <laughs> right, no. But I pointed out in the, in the text, in the writing, that photography is a 19th century medium, very distant from the caves, whereas drawing, painting, or you're using, you're using a hand, the way cro magnon people were using the hands, right? So this idea that the hand, for painters and pianists, the hand is everything, right? And the, the way in which you manipulate keys and mm -hmm. maneuver with your hands is, yeah. is everything. Mm -hmm. The thing, the thing that's worth noting about the caves, if you're an artist, um, is that they speak form. Um, even when they're creating all these, all the animals, but all these shapes, the caves are covered with all these other kinds of shapes. Spots, squares, checkerboard patterns, and the, usually when photographers go in, because because they're a lower form of life, but um, <laughs> photographer, <laughs> photographers go in and take pictures of the animal, right? So there's a horse, I'll take a picture of the horse. I don't know what that other stuff is, yeah. right? And so, so much of what we know and grew up knowing, or my generation grew up knowing about something like Lascaux was, was, was completely distorted. Because they're, they're, you know, a horse may be going by, but there's these, the dots come in, the dots go through the animal, the dots are in the animal, but, and then they say it's a spotted horse. Well, it may be a spotted horse, but the spots keep going. Um, and then there's squares and, you know, the Abbey Broy, who was one of the earliest theorists on the subject, said, oh no, those are clan markings, but nobody knows. <laughs> um, but the important thing that you do know as an artist is that it's form. There are things you do know that we know that poor scientists will never understand. <laughs> <laughs> because it's form, right? They're creating form, not just three dimensional, but form that you can feel that has weight and that has physical presence. I mean, that's the great lesson. That's the thing. That's the, you go in and think, holy smoke. And the relationship to sound, not to forget that maybe some area might have had markings. We're talking about the markings that yep. are more abstract. Yep. Some people have actually done research that there might be some resonances from one marking to another mm -hmm. marking. Yeah. Is it performance space also? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. No, there's that you can go, I'm, I'm telling you, yeah. we can go take our seat at a cafe in southwestern France. And no, because we don't know, we, we, cannot, we cannot have any record of the sound. Yeah, we right. don't know. Oh, no, but we, we don't know. We, it's very important to think of the sound of the cave. But they also, they found, yeah, there's all kinds of bits and pieces. There was flutes yeah. and things like that, so we don't, we, we don't even have any idea. Playing on the stone. Yeah. Uh, right. Have they done, they must have played around with the acoustic of these spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. She did. <laughs> 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 uh, Cindy just said to Nicole Petrovic, I want to talk to you, and I think it would be a good idea, unless there's one last question or anything, we don't have to leave yet. It would be a great chance to talk with one another, uh, look at the paintings on the wall, the book, uh, Simon Farr, my book is there, along with the earlier books we've done. Um, um, but I don't want to prematurely cut off. Now, does anyone else want to say anything collectively before we talk individually? I, I just want yes, to please. Why, why there's no mention of the sacred. Because that's how yeah. I've always seen it. Yeah. Oh, that's how, yeah. That, and then that's absolutely how everyone, uh, mm -hmm. when you walk into those spaces, that, where are you? You, you yeah. feel it. Yeah. 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 I yeah I absolutely. Going. I'm going to answer that question for Simon, which is that he, he, um, He's painted, as I mentioned, he's painted inside of churches. His work is about the sacred in every one of its instantiations. And so I think no mention of the sacred is, like Si Kong Tu, the Tang Chinese dynasty poet, has it, no mention of self 
you had a passion too deep to be born, right? You're gonna, you, you maybe don't want to mention that, right? Maybe you don't want to mention that because it's so. Well, no, it's just, I, I think I, everyone who goes into the caves, I've, I've taken many, many groups through different caves in, in the Southwest, and the first thing people come out and say is it's a church. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sacred space. Yeah. But what do you do with that? Yeah. You know, uh, it's, deep, it's a deep emotional reaction that people have to it. And everybody does. And if you go back in, it happens again. Um, I guess what we're, we're talking about is trying to decode that, trying to understand how that happens, or trying to understand what the, what the process of that happens. Because we don't, it, like I said before, it's like walk, it's as if you walked into a cathedral and didn't have a book, right? You're walking into an ornate, decorated space, but you don't have the text. So, so we perceive, we leap across that and say, yes, it's a sacred space. Absolutely, I would agree. But how is it sacred? In the same way you want to know, um, it's not good enough that there's, you walk into a space and see a story, you want to know what the story is. Or you want to try to find it. And for an artist, it's right there. It's, uh, the line in form are right there speaking to you. Mm -hmm. Who was it that said, I can't see you? Oh, you mean the Akalusha? Oh, you? Yeah. <laughs> I was in the, I, I don't remember the name of the case, but um, it had, was a perfect room. I mean, we had to go about, it was at least longer than an hour to get to the yep. site. Yep. And, um, and then there was, this absolutely perfectly round room that just did not look, you know, manufactured in any way. You know, it was just a cube. And before we actually stepped inside, the guy sang, and the sound was incredible in that room. You know, and I, I've always sort of, you know, I, I come from a very religious background, and I always, for me, um, that's what was the powerful thing. And, and also the fact that there's paintings that are on top of other paintings. Yes. You know, that it's the making, it's the making it. And, it, and, and some of them are in absolutely areas that you cannot get to. You know, you have to go down and like ride on a rope or something. Yeah. Um, and it, it was the making of it that I said. So I, I, I always thought it was the And they're layered over hundreds of years, so it's not spaces, a... Yeah. spaces, You would know. No, thank you, sir. That's... There's a question in the back. I see a hand. Yeah. <coughs> uh, yeah. Not really a question, but Comment. just an addition here. Yeah. Um, you said Simon's idea of some, something being very special and very sacred, and and that and the previous comment about the trend, the 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 transitive nature of the thing that, that set the image off. In there's a cave, Tazagam. Which is known for a big uh, a procession of life-size bulls across the mm. across the main cave. Um, that same person painted that series. Uh, obviously, did another one, a smaller one on the side, which is two antelope um, or antelope-like animals. Uh, so there's a there's a female kneeling down, sitting down with his head up, and a male standing with his head down, and there's the big masses of these animals that are life size, but as, it, as the image works to the two heads, it gets more and more delicate, and, and finally it's just the two heads uh, scoured, the outline scoured into the rock, um, and you have to really look to see this. But the male, the male antelope is clinging is, with its tongue is clinging the ear of the female. Um, there's, there's no hunting gadget or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> this is something that the observer saw, thought was beautiful, tried to get down on, on tried to put the image down on it. And very, very special. Um, and that's the nature of a lot of these things. And just to say that I know there's a lot of people here who draw and are drawing. Um, and that's what this is. This is the heritage of drawing. This is you, this is your world. And I hope that when you look at that and think in terms of that, or when you're drawing Monday morning, when you'll be drawing, um, it's drawing that brings us here. It's drawing that brings us understanding. It's drawing that brings us an ability to 
both understand and analyze what's going on, which, which completely undercuts all the intellectual stuff that all the other teachers are saying. Um, <laughs> completely, in, you know, how can you know anything about these caves if you haven't got a degree in anthropology? You can know an enormous amount about them. Um, you can experience them deeply and you can learn from them deeply. And that's, a, I mean, that's really the best thing that came out of all those years, which wasn't that many years in the end. But, um, and that's what I hope a little bit of that comes into, uh, into these pictures. Mm -hmm. but, but where does that leave the poet? Not uh, every Stein said, the horse is the horse is the Gertrude Stein or Groucho Marx? <laughs> 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 well, horse feathers, it's a different horse, horse feathers, sorry. Horse feathers, yeah. horse feathers. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Thanks so much for coming. Please do take a look at the book. Jack Norman says. <laughs> and there's some refreshments and the inevitable pretzels. And some wine. <coughs> some wine. The book is normally $30. Today it's $10. So uh, take a look. Thank you. And let's talk.